Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's live update. I'm Chancellor Don D. Plowman. As always, we will begin today with an update on our COVID case data. And after that, we will discuss the updates on campus restrictions that we put in place two weeks ago. Uh, we're gonna report on our comprehensive testing efforts and also our plans to move students into Massey Hall for isolation next week. Today, I have with me on the call, Dr. Spencer Gregg, Provost John Zomchuk, and Vice Chancellor for Student Life, Frank Cuevas. They're getting really experienced at this. Thank you all for being here. So let's get started. First, let's look at the numbers. We currently have 119 active COVID-19 cases. 114 of these are students and five are employees. So today's totals, um, if you look at that line, uh, both of these lines, let's go back to that previous one just for a second. Uh, the line is going down like we wanted and we're gonna talk about that. So that's active cases. And remember active cases, part of why it's gone down is a lot of people have recovered. And those numbers are up in the left-hand corner under recoveries. We've also, we've changed the way we're presenting the data. We've added a new graph and let's look at that one next. So we now have a graph that shows new cases. The way we were reporting it before included new cases, existing and existing cases. And every time we pulled each day, we would pulled out the recoveries. You could figure out how many new cases there were, but now we're making it more easy to see. So what you see here is we had a big spike, both those charts show it back around the end of August, the 1st of September. The number of new recoveries has started coming down. It's gone back up a little bit in the last couple of days. So we have 32 new recoveries as of today and 15 new active cases reported since yesterday. Um, this number is based on the submissions of self-isolation forms that indicate a positive COVID-19 case. Again, as you see here, 15 new cases reported to us yesterday. Now, if you look at the next chart, we always show this one as well. We have 40, 458 people in quarantine or self-isolation. And these numbers follow, as you might expect, the other numbers. So the line's continuing to go down. Of the people in self-isolation, 412 of them are students. So we're seeing a decrease, a sharp decrease in case counts in part because of a reduction in the spread of the virus. And I'd like to think to some degree the restrictions we put in place. We also know it a, reflects a decrease in participation in testing. We're testing much less than we were. Fewer people are coming in for testing. Um, so let's talk, uh, let's get some straight talk from Dr. Gregg about these numbers. So when you see these numbers, what do you see? Are you happy? Are you concerned? What are you thinking about? I still can't no. remember to unmute yeah. all the time. So good morning. It's good to see you again this morning. Well, we are concerned about these low numbers. Uh, hopefully, they reflect a lower rate of infection. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what you know we want to see with all the mitigation efforts that we've been doing. But as you stated, our concern is really related to the possibility that it's more likely a reflection of decreased participation in testing and self-isolation procedures. At the Student Health Center, we have seen a significant decline in the number of individuals being tested. And it's not because of a lack of uh, availability of tests. Uh, so as we get more information uh, back from our saliva and wastewater testing efforts going forward, hopefully we'll have a little more clarity uh, a little greater certainty into what's actually causing these changes and uh, know better how to proceed. Okay. Well, so let's talk about the testing a little bit. There's been, there were a couple articles in the Knoxville News Sentinel about the testing. Uh, reporters were out here. Our faculty researchers were showing them what they're doing. So this week we've been conducting pooled sample testing at both White and Hess Halls. Participation in this sample collection was required for all the residents and we should be getting those results early next week. So Dr. Gregg, talk a little bit about this. What are you expecting to see in these two dorms? We did pooled saliva testing. What are they gonna tell us when we get those results back? 
Well, we certainly expect to see most, if not all of our campus residential facilities as we proceed with this saliva testing. We'll have some likelihood of, of positive cases being present. Our uh, pooled saliva and wastewater testing can give us an idea of the general positivity rate for a given residential facility. And so for like uh, White and Hess Hall, we expect we're gonna get some number of individuals that, are, that reflect a positive level there. And with time, as we test more and more facilities, uh, we will get a better understanding of what the positivity rate is across our campus as a whole. In turn, that gives us an idea of the likelihood of your risk of exposure on campus because as that positivity rate goes up, you're actually more likely to be exposed. And then that informs decisions uh, about what community mitigation efforts or restrictions we need to have in place. Okay, so this pooled saliva testing it's going to help us see and understand some things. What are the limitations of this test? There are definitely limitations to the test. Um, the goal of the saliva testing is to estimate the level of active infections on campus or within any given residential facility. We also expect this testing to be helpful in identifying individuals or groups of individuals that may be more likely to be actively infected. So the chief limitation is that we are not going to be able to verify who those individuals are through the saliva test alone. So, so then what would be the next steps? Let's say you, you get information that says, well, in this pool of five, it looks like the virus is there. Then what happens? Well, there will need to be next steps. Uh, Self-collected samples carry a greater likelihood of uh, inaccuracy. So more accurate testing will be required of some individuals. Individual residents or, or groups of residents that are identified through the saliva testing as possibly more likely to be infected will be contacted by the Student Health Center and scheduled a time to come in to have a provider performed nasal swab PCR test. Our pooled saliva uh, test cannot be used to confirm infection. They only help in identifying who might be infected but the provider performed nasal swab PCR test is the test that must be performed to know for certain if someone is actually infected or positive. Residents will have to see a provider to have that test performed and individuals needing that test will be contacted by the Student Health Center to schedule that testing. It's also important to note that just because you're not identified as having a higher likelihood of being infected through these tests, it doesn't mean that you're not infected. It simply means that on the day you provided your saliva sample, you were not identified as someone with a higher likelihood of being positive. So continuing to take all those necessary health and safety precautions to protect yourself and others is still very important. Thank you, Dr. Gregg. And, and I just wanna remind folks that two or three reasons why we're doing this type of testing. One is to get a picture of the, the health of the whole community. Secondly, it is a more efficient way of finding the virus than regularly nasal testing everybody. Those are very expensive. And, and, and I think the third thing I, I want people to remember is that this is now, as long as COVID is with us on this campus, and there are many other campuses doing the same thing, this is gonna become kind of a part of our life, is this regular testing. So we were in White and Hess this week. We'll be back there at another time. We'll be moving to other dorms throughout this semester and next semester. And for everyone living in university housing, either dorms or the Greek houses, this was a part of the agreement uh, that you made when you signed the contract that, that you, would, you may be required to participate in testing as we go along. And so I wanna thank everyone who participated this week. We it, Everyone needs to recognize this is becoming a way of life. And so uh, it's, it's a way, a really smart way that we're keeping our campus safe. Really big shout out to the faculty members who are leading this effort, who've converted their labs. It's just, it's really inspiring when our faculty step forward to say, you know what, we're gonna help keep this safe place, this place safe as well. So it's not just Dr. Gregg's job. You got partners, a lot right. of people helping you. And I'm so, thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, yeah, you need it. So let's let's talk about the restrictions. So here's there's some good news. So two weeks ago, we put in place a number of restrictions to help slow down the virus at the time when we were seeing large increases in our cases. And I want to thank everyone who who have been following the rules. It 
it's I, it's been great to see it across campus. I told I, I announced then that when we started seeing significant declines in the numbers, we would relook at the restrictions. And so today I'm announcing we are lifting some of the campus restrictions affecting this coming Monday. First, we will reopen T-Rex begin, beginning Monday morning. And I know that's one that hurt the most uh, to a lot of people, not getting to work out like they're, they're used to. Uh, we have a lot of strict protocols over there. We, we know it's going to be safe. And now that the transmission numbers seem to have gone down, that seems like a very reasonable one to put back in place. So Monday morning, T-Rex is open and it's normal hours. Second, we will resume indoor events that follow safety guidelines for social distancing and mask wearing. We expect everyone to continue to abide by our guidelines and those set by the Knox County Board of Health, which limit indoor gatherings to 25 people within the same 900 square foot space. So just think that through. Their rule was limiting indoor gatherings to 25 people within the same 900 square foot space. For now, we will continue the restrictions on visitors in the residence halls and sororities and fraternity houses. In other words, only residents may go in those, those halls or houses. So this includes outside visitors and, and also visiting between rooms. We just, until we know better uh, exactly what the transmission level is in the dorms, we're encouraging students to primarily gather in their own rooms. So we will go ahead also in the dorms and reopen some of the study spaces. Students have been asking me about that. As I talk with students across campus, uh, that need is really there. There are restrictions on how many people can go in there, uh, the limited number of chairs, and so we'll expect people to follow that in the study spaces in those halls. We want to be able to lift additional restrictions, but we need further information to do so. So the data from our comprehensive testing efforts in the residence halls and the Greek houses will be critical in, for, in informing whether we can lift restrictions going forward. So for now, I think that's some good news. I hope people hear that what we've announced and let's work towards more good news in the future. We're distributing saliva test kits to all the residence halls eventually so that they're ready for students. And when it's your dorm's turn to provide the sample or your house's turn, you will receive specific instructions on exactly what you're supposed to do. So thank you in advance for your uh, joyful participation in that process. I do wanna address, however, some compliance issues we've had on our, in our campus libraries about mask wearing, social distancing, and exceeding capacity in study spaces. And I'm gonna ask Provost Zomchik to talk to us a little bit about the complaints that we've had. What is our library staff seeing? What are they ex experiencing? What's going on there? Thank you, Chancellor. Good morning. Uh, before, I, before I tell you what they're seeing, what they've been reporting, I just wanna say a word about the importance, <clears throat> excuse me, of the library. It's a, it's a really, really popular place for our students to go and congregate and to study. And we're trying to make them able to study in a socially distanced way. But it's also an essential space for our faculty to use for their scholarship and their research. So it's <clears throat> very important. We need to keep that library safe for the use of our entire university community. We can't afford to have it become a a, a site of community transmission, which could force us to close the building and deprive faculty and students from having a place to hold appropriate and safe and essential scholarly activities. We also need to show care to our library staff who've kept the library open for the benefit of all of its patrons. So over the summer, the library staff and facility staff work to mark where furniture should go so that the patrons could keep appropriate physical distance. And they reduced the capacity of some of our small study rooms so we could comply with the appropriate health mandates. <clears throat> Holly Mercer, our interim dean of the university libraries is reporting that some students are moving that furniture to be closer to other students in the open study areas, or they're ignoring the capacity limits in the smaller closed study rooms. 
these actions are increasing the risk of disease transmission. But most worrisome is Dean Mercer's report that compliance with our facial covering mandate among library patrons sometimes falls as low as 15%, 15%, typically in the mid to late afternoons. These behaviors are putting everyone who uses the library at increased risk of getting sick. So later in the day and in the evenings, yes, we are going to be expecting students and um, enforcing the mask uh, directive. So I've had students all over campus telling me I need to be able to study late at night. Um, so we're going to be working on getting those hours to what students want. And it is essential that students cooperate and comply with the restrictions. Uh, the, the, the facial mask could not be more important. So I look forward to everyone uh, remembering who we are as volunteers and that we care about one another and wear your mask in there and be respectful to the staff who are the reason we're able to keep that open. So thank you very much. Let me, let me turn now to Vice Chancellor Cuevas. Vice Chancellor Cuevas is uh, in charge of student life. And he's gonna talk to us about the preparations that are underway uh, in Massey Hall. So let's just remind everyone this week, uh, we had an amazing staff in housing and facilities that have been working like crazy to prepare Massey Hall to welcome students. It was a big conversion. Everybody moved out, got tested, then moved out or moved to an isolation space. It's empty, it's been cleaned. Uh, I wanna thank our original Massey Hall residents who were so um, in such a good spirit about that. Uh, I really am impressed for their willingness to make this unexpected move and we were just minimal complaints. We know what a disruption that was. And we're very appreciative. So Victor, I mean, uh, Frank Cuevas, could you talk to us a little bit about the preparation? So. What sort of work has gone into making this residence hall uh, appropriate, up to speed, and ready to welcome isolating students? Good morning, Chancellor, and thank you. Um, I also want to thank our, our former Massey students because it was a, we recognize it was a huge disruption to their lives, and they moved very quickly. They complied, and overall, they left the building in very good shape. I, as when our staff walked through and looked at the rooms, they were. They were clean, they were in great shape. But with that said, we have, been, our staff has been going into the past week, deep cleaning, cleaning all the other areas throughout the building and putting in place all the logistics necessary for us to reopen this facility for students who may need to isolate. And, and again, making sure that we have everything we need to make it as a comfortable move for our students. Reopening the, the common areas, making sure that we have linens in the rooms, all the, uh, there's a micro fridges in all of the rooms, everything that a student's gonna to need to make sure that that facility is as comfortable as possible when students are in, in, in isolation housing. So talk a little bit, if you could, um, about the move into Massey, who's going in there and how exactly is that gonna work? Absolutely. Um, our logistics team will work very closely with our contact tracing team. So our contact tracing team will reach out to students to determine whether they need to isolate or quarantine based on their individual uh, living circumstances. And then for those students that need to move into isolation housing, Massey Hall will be used as our primary isolation space on campus. Um, so when students then are going needing to be uh, moving into isolation housing, they'll contact our contact, our contact tracing team, we'll work with our logistics team to ensure that we get students adequately moved into the facility. We'll have transportation available for students that need transportation to Massey Hall. We'll make sure the food and delivery services are available for students throughout their time in, in isolation housing. We're even going to have set up um, uh, snack, 24-hour snacks, uh, and grab and go snacks so that students, again, to create as comfortable experience as possible for our students that are there. So as students are moved into the facility, then um, we'll make sure that they have the resources they need. Thank you so much, Frank, and thanks to you and your team for your hard work. You know, one of the things we said at the beginning of this, we're going to have to be creative, compassionate, and flexible, and it, we're, we're doing that every day. 
And I think your team has really showed that as well. And the students showed maximum flexibility in their willingness to move and their parents for uh, helping them with that. So thanks to everyone. So lastly, before we sign off, tomorrow's our first football game. Next week's our first home football game. I want everyone to please keep in mind the health gu guidelines as you celebrate and enjoy the game tomorrow. We're all gonna be cheering the Vols on and we all feel really positive about what's gonna happen up there. Uh, if you choose to gather with friends, please do so in a responsible, socially distanced way, following the guidelines of Knox County Health Department. Uh, wear your masks, yell hard and go Vols. <laughs>